years of professional expertise working in Nigeria on transparency and accountability issues in government. He has seen the importance of accountability as a critical driver of progress in key sectors such as procurement, health, justice, security, and service delivery. Buddy, you're welcome. And to my immediate left is Cynthia Chikweya of the African, uh, she is an African Union Youth for Peace Program Ambassador for Southern Africa. Cynthia Chigweya is a political researcher and academic with extensive experience in advocacy, policy making, and international development. She has spoken at various symposia, including the 2022 EU AU Summit, Egypt's Aswan Forum for Sustainable Peace, and the BRICS Roundtable Dialogue on Financing Clean Technologies in Cities. Cynthia, you are very much welcome. And then our fifth panelist is Professor Charles OKJ. Uh, you can see him online. Um, okay, I can see his name, but I hope his photo will appear at some point. Uh, he is a scholar, a teacher, and a policy analyst. Professor Charles OKJ holds a doctorate in international relations from the Obafemiya Wunowo University. Um, and he became a professor in 2008. He has held several research and teaching positions in leading institutions around the world and has worked as a technical and consultancy expert for various agencies such as the African Union, ECOWAS, GIZ, UNDP, and other UN agencies. So, Professor Charles UKJ, you are very much welcome. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to join you. Thank you very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we live in interesting times. The global scene is such that we have never seen before. The emerging trends through both disruptions and opportunities. Disruptions in the global order, challenges to multilateralism, democratic backsliding, democratic anxieties, and growing inequalities. In spite of all this, we see also emerging opportunities for transformation. A lot is happening. And there is an acknowledgement, both on the part of the United States, as well as Africa, that the US cannot advance its global foreign policy without the partnership of Africa. African governments, African organizations, and African people. And Africa also understands that the, its partnership with US is highly valued for a host of historical, practical, strategic, economic, and what I would call cultural reasons. So uh, we have shared opportunities and shared challenges. And we do understand the key role of partnerships in addressing some of these challenges, whether it is in terms of ending the global pandemic, whether it's towards post-pandemic economic recovery, addressing the ongoing climate change, issues around peace, stability, and human rights, marginalization, exclusion, and lack of opportunities. All these issues require something if we are beginning, if we are to begin to address and tackle them. And this issue is democracy. Key to democracy is the whole question of elections. And so we have a key challenge in partnering to renew and strengthen democracy along more inclusive and equitable lines and spread growth and prosperity, both within the US and in Africa, even as we solidify this relationship. And to help us tackle some of the critical questions, I have this distinguished honor. And I will start from my immediate left to ask Cynthia this question. Cynthia, what is your view of the role of African leaders? And when I talk about leaders, I'm actually talking about the leaders of, well, it's kind of a hackneyed term now to say the youth are the leaders of tomorrow. But what would you consider to be the role of the youth and African leaders as well as organizations 
in advancing these partnerships that are so key to US Africa relations in terms of promoting peace, prosperity, security, and development. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Morning. I'm going to need a more resounding response. Good morning. <laughs> morning. Thank you. Um, I like the fact that in, uh, in structuring the question, you highlighted that by African leaders, you're not only referring to those who are in power, because often we make the mistake that leadership must be left to, to those who are in governance. And, and that, that, that's really a big um, shortcoming because it, 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 it exonerates us to an extent of the responsibility that we should take when it comes to, to leadership. Now, in response to, to the question which you posed, I'll um, go first to the role that African youth um, can play in terms of bringing more accountability and ensuring that um, the partnerships that we're discussing here today um, have got results that benefit not just a, a very few population, but have got a, a big extent to benefit a number of people. And I think um, African youth and youth overall have shown that they are the vanguard of democracy, particularly in the past um, three or five years. I'll cite examples, including the Fees Must Fall movement in the South African context, here in the USA, Black Lives Matter movement, um, We've seen Fridays for Future movements and other movements that have erupted that show that young people are not, not only showing that they have a stake in, in doing governance better, but they're also questioning our leadership and bringing them to account and challenging them to do development better. So the role that our African youth can play in terms of leveraging the relations that we're speaking today is to go back to say and, and reflect and bring our um, those are in, in leaders in, 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 in positions of leadership to question and ask them to, to, to keep their word or their promises or their pledges to doing development better. But not only that, I don't think the, the role that the African youth um, should play should only be limited to, to questioning and bringing people to account, but it was also to, to take their stages as, um, it was also to take their stances as leaders themselves, because as you have rightly said that Youth are not only leaders of tomorrow, but they're leaders today. So one of the ways in which they can uh, continuously advance um, sustainability and coexistence is to also take up leadership roles in their various communities. Examples such as the Youth for Peace Africa program, where we have many youth that are leading peace building initiatives in their own context. So that, in, in essence, is saying, OK, we're not going to wait until we get to positions of power to do something, but we're going to contribute towards the change that we want to see. So that is just one of the examples through which um, African youth or youth in general have taken um, leadership positions to ensure that there's more um, there's more good governance and there is more um, um, resorting to, to democratic methods or participatory methods of um, improving their environments. I wasn't um, told how much time I have, but my instructions are to advise that you limit at least your first uh, responses to three minutes. All right, so I think with, with these few remarks, I will lead to, to the next question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, you have uh, really given us food for thought, but uh, in the interest of time, we'll go to, um, to Ode Friday. Um, and my question to you is, what sort of U.S. investments, in your opinion, are needed to better support free and fair elections across Africa, and at the same time, help advance more inclusive and equitable political systems? Thank you very much. Um, good morning once again to everybody. Um, I'll try to do justice to the question. Um, interestingly, we um, back in Nigeria, we had just passed um, the Electoral Act in 2020, then um, elections are going to happen next year, and plans are already ongoing to see how we can have an inclusive um, engagement with young people, um, versus with disability, or participating in the election. Um, but key for me is um, the investment, like you've asked for me, I'll be looking at um, platforms where citizens, the Nigerian citizens can participate. Um, Allow me to read up the democracy requires an informed citizenry to be able to um, question the government. 
it's, it's for me, it looks like that platform of investments where we get young people to participate in elections, to understand what their rights and what it means for them to participate in election. But for drawing the line between politics and governance, we talk about elections. The first part is the politics which has happened back in Nigeria and engagement within political parties. We've seen engagement in that level, but not, so, not much of inclusive participation. So you find political parties who give just the um, leadership of the women to just women and other, the other positions are well taken, by, taken up by men, which now reflects in the election. So how do we begin to make those kind of investment that actually upturns the political parties and their engagement to be very inclusive? Otherwise, you find out governance in a sense will turn into uh, more around having male folks who are the more dominate, dominating and dominating all over the place. And we go back to start talking about the culture of the society. But drawing that line between politics and governance is very clear to see how we can make more investments to ensure young people participate. Um, secondly, for me, um, around the work we do, we talk about accountability as well. I think more, um, um, I also want to thank the US government on at the USAID as well, more particularly on the focus on anti corruption. Um, once you look at those kind of investments, it's it's global, and we, we have to start having those kind of conversations ac across Africa, not, not only in Nigeria as well. Um, once you ask questions to political office, office holder, it becomes a problem. That becomes a problem for the kind of work we do within the civil society organizations, for those of us working around building accountability, because once you start asking those questions, it becomes a problem where you now have repressive government pushing back on, on some of these um, organizations. We now have conversations where it talks about press freedom, um, closing civic space, and beginning to address all of that. So I think more investment should go around into accountability to help the government and drawing a clear line between politics and governance. Otherwise, when you have politicians getting up and getting to office, it's more of their personal gains. Um, we need to begin to have those kind of conversations. So once you get into office, you have to draw a clear line between serving your politics and actually serving the people. And also creating that platform for inclusive governance. Um, we, we started conversations and programs around participatory governance. And one of that is around um, participatory budgeting. Um, over the years, we've seen where a government designs the budget as it suits them in terms of how it favors political parties. But now we're now beginning to build those kind of engagements for young people to participate, for persons with disability to have a part in this, a say in, in budget development processes to so also even have gender based budgeting systems where we also consider how this affects um, the whole society as a whole. So, for me, I'll, I'll, I'll see, be, I'll be glad to see those kind of investments being made around building accountability, around inclusion, and I'll also drawing a clear line within the elections um, between governance and politics. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You've uh... You've said quite a bit, and um, you've actually set yourself up for the next question, but we'll come back to that. It's now my pleasure to uh, to pose the next question to Dave Peterson. And my question is this. In a world where democratic backsliding is rampant, what democratic dividends should U.S. organizations, uh, particularly civil society organizations, be prioritizing in terms of engagement with Africa. How do you see this role? Well, <clears throat> thank you for that question. And, uh, you know, I think, um, first off, I'd just like to make it clear that I'm uh, speaking in my own uh, personal capacity here uh, and not uh, that of the National Endowment for Democracy. So uh, that enables me to be a little bit provocative and uh, to speak my mind. Um, <clears throat> You know, I think, um, uh, uh, first off, in terms of, um, you know, uh, how we look at uh, support for democracy in, in Africa, uh, I think we have to recognize the, the fact of the matter is that, according to Freedom House, uh, 20 uh, sub-Saharan African countries are currently uh, rated not free. Uh, there's no space for democracy, uh, really. Um, you know, I think uh, the uh, second observation I would make about this is that, uh, you know, riffing a little bit off of the uh, first session here, uh, that uh, 
you know, a, a mentor of mine, uh, uh, Byron Rustin, uh, once uh, liked to make the point that um, freedom does not come on a silver platter. You have to struggle for it. And, um, uh, you know, I think uh, really that's what we are seeing in Africa today. So even though um, there's been a lot of backsliding, uh, you know, it's been very disappointing, the uh, coups in uh, Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Guinea, uh, in Sudan. Um, I think uh, that uh, there is also uh, progress and there is hope. Uh, you know, I think uh, a few months ago, the elections in Kenya were really an outstanding example of, uh, you know, how uh, you know, uh, civil society, uh, the electoral commission, uh, the judiciary, uh, you know, really the people of Kenya uh, were able to, uh, you know, step forward and have, uh, you know, despite the uh, contentiousness and, and, and how close the elections were, uh, they were free and fair, and uh, you know Kenya has a, a democratic government uh, that they can be proud of. And uh, you know I think uh, uh, the elections that have come up in Nigeria, uh, by the same token, uh, you know represent a lot of promise. Uh, there's a lot of excitement around them. Uh, I've observed every election in Nigeria since 1999, and I know uh, you know that uh, uh, they uh, can be a little bit messy. Uh, to say the least, uh, but uh, you know these upcoming elections have generated a lot of uh, excitement, uh, and uh, you know I think that uh, possibility of them uh, sort of uh, taking Nigeria to the uh, next stage of uh, consolidating the democratic gains that they've made uh, is really uh, is very real. Uh, of course, later this year there's going to be more elections. Um, uh, the elections uh, hopefully. Uh, in DRC uh, before the end of the year, uh, stand a real chance of being uh, uh, democratic. Uh, you know, there's lots of problems, uh, security issues, same in uh, Nigeria, of course, uh, and uh, the elections in Zimbabwe as well that uh, could take place uh, later this year. Uh, despite the challenges there, uh, you know, um, uh, the United States is involved in every one of these places. Uh, you know, I think to support the election process, and you know, that's good. Uh, we need to do more of that. I think, you know, uh, uh, in case of Sudan during a, a democratic transition there, we really let the Sudanese people down by not coming in uh, 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 sooner and uh, more generously. Uh, and and I, I think uh, a final point that I want to make is that, um, you know, I talked about uh, uh, the struggle, and, and uh, Africa has power. Uh, you know, it's not just a matter of uh, sort of begging for favors uh, from the uh, West. Uh, I mean, the Africa summit is no accident. Uh, it should have happened a long time ago. But the fact of the matter is that uh, China uh, is there. Uh, trade with China and Africa is six times of what it is with the United States. Uh, you know, the Russians are getting involved. You know, everybody's worried about Ukraine. You know, that's understandable, but, uh, you know, the Russians are coming to Africa, too, and, and there's competition for Africa, and Africans have power yes. uh, to demand from the United States. You know, look, uh, you know, if you want access to our resources, if you want uh, our diplomatic support, then you better bring something to the table. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that's what we need to remember. So uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, uh, David. Your statement that Africa has power is profound. Uh, but again, you're setting yourself up for the next question that you follow. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. This has been a very interesting first round of questions, but I have my eye on time. So I'm just going to ask short questions for the second round, and um, you will have three minutes to respond before I throw, it, throw questions open to this distinguished audience as well as our online participants. I'm coming back to Cynthia. Cynthia, your observations about youth as leaders is a very profound one. I was actually quite intrigued to hear this. And then you follow this up with illustrations of the fact that the youth were the vanguard of, of protests and demands for accountability for better government. Governance. One of the things that I ask myself is, 
youth in Africa as leaders at the vanguard. Where do you see opportunities for US-Africa cooperation in ways that would further empower youth leaders, both in terms of their activism on the continent and ways they should engage both their leaders as well as international community? Where do you see the opportunities? Thank you very much again for, for that question. And I think for at, at the top of my head, the first is um, the youth as um, grassroots workers. And I reference in my in my first response that there are several number of um, young people that actually do community work, either as peace builders or um, as training diverse or even um, campaigning when it comes to elections. We find a big number of young people participating in that. So I think capacitation of young people at the grassroots level, and this becomes a challenge, particularly when it comes to uh, partnerships between either um, governments or big international organizations, where there's generally preference for more established organizations. And then in the process, youth become sort of the uh, they, they at the receiving end. But when it comes to partnership from the onset, it's often um, given to other more established organizations. So when it comes to cooperation, we need to rethink and actually approach our, our programs or initiatives with youth as key stakeholders. So that is just the first um, example through which uh, this cooperation can be enhanced so that young people are not only regarded as recipients of different programs at the very end, but they're included uh, from the onset. The second way through which particularly um, the US um, and Africa can cooperate to, to promote um, activism on the continent is to, to um, encourage youth participation in democratic processes. While in my first response, I referred to, to protests and activism as one of the ways through which young people can participate, I think we can all agree that these are just alternative methods of participating in democratic processes. Actually, young people should be participating in elections and in structured uh, conversations or even in dialogues such as the ones that we're having in this room. But the fact that we're seeing increasingly a number of people opting to participate online through various hashtags or on the street through various protests are actually reflective of uh, their lack or, or declining belief in democratic processes. So the corporation should actually seek to make politics more appealing to young people and not just inviting to them, but it should actually be appealing so that those who now think that um, activism or, or, or protesting are the actual the only means of, of participating in democratic processes are brought back into the formal methods and more um, invited spaces of democratic engagement. And then uh, finally, in terms of um, US-Africa cooperation, and also cooperation with various um, African countries, I think it is also important to, to train young people and um, to encourage capacity building beyond just financing. Because uh, several times when we speak of engagement and collaboration, this is limited to, to financing. Now, while financing is very important, without the skills of the strategies or the know-how to implement certain purchases or initiatives, we find that um, some of the, the, the funds that get into, into the different processes do not really reach full capacity because of limited skills to leverage on, on the varied opportunities. So some of the ways through which we can actually encourage, um, we can encourage capacity building is to conduct trainings. And in the, in the first panel that we heard, we heard of that um, listening to young people to the various groups that we're targeting, go into the communities where young people are working, ask them what they think should be uh, contributed to various programs. And oftentimes we find that those who are working on the ground and grassroots already have an idea of what they want included in certain initiatives. So um, I think to just um, wrap my, my, uh, my contributions up, it is to say that, um, that the, the reason Maxim that says anything for us without us is against us. So include young people from the onset, treat them as key stakeholders, and I think that would be one of the ways in which we can figure out how to enhance cooperation between the different states and youth stakeholders. Thank you very much, Christine. That was great. Well, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I kind of didn't go online. And now that I'm back online, I want to ask uh, Professor KJ for forgiveness. 
and um, ask him his question. So, Professor Keja, are you still with us? Yes, I'm right here. I was wondering uh, whether you have uh, disenfranchised me. No, 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 no. Absolutely. We are all for inclusiveness. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. My question to you is this. I know that you've done a lot of work um, in terms of um, policy analysis. So I'm going to put you on the spot in terms of the Biden administration's Africa strategy. And just looking at that strategy, where do you see the opportunities in terms of supporting democratic renewal, expansion, and consolidation based on your experience of the APSA, the African Peace and Security Architecture, issues around the work you've done on African youth? How do you think uh, the, the, the Africa strategy addresses the realities all ground in Africa and where do you see the opportunities for advancing democracy on the continent? Um, thank you very much. And I'm glad that uh, I'm able to join this um, conversation. I'd like to thank my colleagues for the very interesting insights that you all brought to the conversation. I don't know whether you can, um, see me can you see me we can't see you we only really see your name i don't know where, why the it will be nice to see me because my camera is on but otherwise um talk to our people here somebody is uh, the advice is to turn it off and turn it back on your camera uh no i can't do that otherwise i don't have guarantees that this is not going to go off completely it's, it's okay if we just hear your voice then <laughs> okay okay <laughs> okay <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. I, I, I think that um, a lot, there was a lot of there has been a lot of concern um, in the early days of the Biden administration whether there will in fact be an African policy, whether the administration would have any strategy, any mention of Africa. And you know, there's always been a concern that um, Africa seems to be falling off the map in um, global, um, you know, in, in in the from the perspective of global powers, um, and. Um, You should be able to, when you rejoin, you should be able to, you should be able to see them. Sorry, one moment. There we go. Okay. Ah. Thank you. Now you can see now me. See okay. you. It feels a lot better. Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, too. So, so, so there, there was a lot of concern whether the Biden administration will even have anything to do with Africa. Um, so the strategy, the Afghan strategy itself is, is, uh, is coming, you know, um, at a time when these concerns have been, you know, expressed in various quarters. Um, and I think for the purpose of this conversation, the, the focus is really about expanding equitable partnerships. Uh, of course, I, I don't know whether it can either be an equitable, if ever be an equitable partnership, but partnership nonetheless. Uh, but I would like to say that um, supporting democratic openings and opportunities will require a number of things. And as my people back home would say, um, if the gods cannot help me, they should not complicate my problems. And this is what I hear from where people, you know, in different parts of Africa, from Cairo to Cape Town, you know, are saying about not just the United States, but um, Britain, major powers engagement in, with Africa. Um, I think first and foremost, um, the US has a responsibility, you know, to serve as moral guarantor of processes of democratization or deepening democracy in Africa. And by moral guarantor, I don't necessarily mean that it should be the policeman of, of, of the, in the, on the continent, of democracy on the continent, but have a responsibility to speak out, um, you know, when things that seems, developments that seems to be undermining, you know, or should change the democracy, you know, is um, are happening on the continent. Uh, more often than not, you know, I hear people say that, you know, what is the United States doing? What is US position? Why is the US not able to rein in, you know, on, you know, some of, you know, the challenges that African countries are facing, especially challenges that arise from, you know, the behavior of those who are, you know, interlocutors of power on the continent. Uh, so for me, I think it's, it's very, very important that the US stands on higher moral ground you know, on, on that moral ground when it comes to speaking out about, you know, development on the continent and not just speak out, you know, but also um, put its weight behind it because, you know, there's no doubt that the US has enormous 
uh, enormous political diplomatic leverage, you know, that it can exercise, you know, in different parts of Africa. But, you know, it, it, it has to be able to put it, you know, uh, as and when necessary. It's also important that the U.S. supports civil society organizations that are doing very creative things across the continent. Uh, and I'll give you an example. I don't know how many of you have heard about the Not Too Young to Run bill um, in Nigeria. Um, uh, this bill enabled, you know, it first and foremost brought down the age for contest into different positions. Um, it brought for president from 40 to 30, uh, members of the House of Reps from 30 to 25, uh, but it retained the governorship and Senate at 35. But the real point I want to make there is that that whole push received a lot of support from the British government. Okay, and eventually when the, the bill was passed into law, signed into law by the president in May, 2018, uh, it opened up new opportunities, you know, for young people, you know, to play, you know, a major role in elections. And you could see how, even though it is not a lot, but you could see how a whole lot of young people are now in parliament, in positions, it's one bold, one little step, but it's a major one, no doubt. Uh, I think it's also important to acknowledge that um, one of the biggest threats to democracy in Africa is the challenge imposed around peace and security. Uh, how do you have elections in the context in which a large part of the Northeast of Nigeria, for instance, um, is um, where the devil is on state visit with the activities of uh, insurgency movements and terrorist groups, you know, in that part of Nigeria. Okay, uh, how do you ensure that, you know, in rural areas in Nigeria where banditry has become a way of life, where people have to pay taxes to bandits and to terrorists, you know, in order for them to be able to even go to their farms. So peace and security is linked to, you know, the ability to have to engage around elections and to conduct elections that will be considered credible and inclusive. And I think that for me, this is another area that um, the US government and indeed, you know, Africa's partners can play a major role. Um, I hear Cynthia loud and clear talking about the role that young people play. This for me is very, very important. And this, this is really where we have to put a whole lot of resources into. Uh, and I say this because across the continent, you would see that in most countries, two thirds of the population are below the, below the age of you know, 30, okay? Um, and there is concern that if this age category are disenfranchised from processes of elections and you know, democracy and governance, you know, it's a recipe for disaster. So investing in this young you know, um, category is also very, very important. So for me, these are the major issues and uh, support to building peace because peace can only lead to, you know, create the right kind of spaces for democratic elections and democratic consolidation. Ensure that you play the role of moral guarantor, not one that is um, double speaking, you know, on very important issues. So for me, this, these are some of the issues that I'd like to bring on the table. I know you already have questions, you know, arising from those that you'd like to raise uh, next. So I'm, I'm waiting. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Charles, for, for your intervention. You've raised some very critical questions, and I'm sure the audience is listening attentively and they pose some back to you. So uh, on the Friday, you, you, you spoke you know, a lot about what the US is doing in um, Africa. And sometimes I'm tempted to ask people, what can Africa do for the US? Um, and so I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm sorry. That do you think there are things under the radar in terms of what young people are doing in Africa, in terms of your work uh, at the accountability lab that are worthy of note and that are useful, both in terms of the ongoing conversation around cooperation? I'm not saying that Africa should keep U.S. democracy, but are there things that the U.S. may want to know about its work in terms of co cooperating to advance democracy, accountability, and transparency that can actually help policymakers and practitioners on this side to actually do better 
and also communicate to their colleagues on the continent in ways that will actually make your own life uh, as a practitioner easier. That's really a tough one, um, putting me in the spots. But yeah, I'll try my best. Um, well, first of all, I, I, I think I want to touch on what um, Dr. Akko mentioned earlier on about Kim Kardashian and young people having a say. Um, it's their decision, right? Um, but one of the things we do at the lab that really excites me is the engagement of young people through creative ways, uh, using music, using film, using um, just recently, we had we we started a we, we basically do a pro program um, with young young people, um, young music artists, trying to engage um, with music, um, creating songs that can actually influence the society in terms of creating that information they need. Um, if you look at young people, like we've talked about them across the board, they are not well informed, but they need to get interested in governance in ways that interest them in in things that they are, they. I'm more attracted to. So for me, one of the things I want to look at is using arts and culture. Um, we have over 2,400 um, minority children who die daily in Nigeria, according to UNICEF. And we are beginning to think in terms of how do you want to revert those kind of things? And we are beginning to look at creating figurines using arts um, to engage policymakers to actually soil their hands to make those figurines to understand sometimes it's easy to sit on the side of the table like we are talking to all of you um these are what policy makers do sometimes they sit on the side and just decide on what happens um for all of us but we're now beginning to say policy makers you need to understand how what happens on a day soil your hands and make figurines of children that die daily and all get that feeling and understanding of what that will tra translate in terms of when we go to the polls in march in february and march how do people want to understand the decision making processes that can influence decision making processes that affects all of us in an inclusive style or I'll say inclusive governance way, not necessarily just making decision or policies from that decision. Um, so for me it's us. Um, secondly, for, for, for us at the lab as well, it's more around digital governance, um, which we have seen um, across across board. Um, when you look at what happened with the NSAS movement in Nigeria in 2020, a lot of things happened in terms of donations, in terms of campaigns, in terms of virtual engagements, um, which was largely driven by young people. Young people are really creative, and this is one of the things I think we need to look at and, and not overlook as well. That process actually leads the governments to start rethinking I think one of, if, if I may mention, one of, one of the um, government officials started clamoring for they want to push us out of power, but that is not the way to do it. You need to go to the polls. But young people are only just collaborating and engaging in creative ways using digital technologies that even led to the Twitter ban um, at, at that year. And so those are things for me I, I look at when you want to see how you want to bring creativity out of young people in, in Africa in general and also bringing in um, arts and culture to see how we can use that as a platform for improving governance and processes and policies across the board. Um, I think I'll stop from there. Oh, the so. interesting thing is that you've actually touched on something very crucial. And even though you thought that you were being put on the spot, that challenge has actually brought up something very unique. And I'm beginning to imagine if your organization, for example, can work with youth here in the United States to share some experiences. This is something that would be a soft power issue, but it's something that you have done, and this is something that you can actually share. So you see, you actually answered the question very, very nicely. And now, David, you told us Africa has power. But I'm going to ask you to reflect on your experience. You've been in this line of work since 1988, and you just gave us some emerging success stories in Africa, pointing to Kenya, and we can add one or two other countries. In your experience, in relation to civil society engagement, those success stories, what do you think are the key ingredients that have contributed to their success? And what do you think accounts 
for those who have been less than successful? And how do you think the current engagement in US-Africa relations can actually yield on the lessons based on your personal reflections to advance and renew democracy and expand opportunities uh, for young people in Africa? Wow, uh, that's a really tough question. I don't know whether I should thank you for it or not, but uh, I'll do my best to uh, try to uh, give some ideas. I mean, you know, I think, um, uh, of course, uh, civil society uh, comes in many different uh, uh, forms. Um, uh, you know, uh, there are mass movements, uh, there are uh, non governmental organizations. Uh, there are uh, communities like uh, the church, the trade unions, uh, and you know I think all these uh, combined uh, have uh, very uh, different important roles in uh, taking democracy forward in, in Africa. And so, uh, you know I think um, uh, there's always um, a need for uh, I hate to use the word. Uh, you know, it gets thrown out a lot, but inclusivity. Um, you know, I think uh, where uh, an NGO is uh, maybe working at an elite level and isn't engaging with the uh, citizens, you know, that's a problem. If a trade union, by the same token, is you know really all about uh, the leadership there, and you know they're not uh, addressing the needs of their membership, uh, that's a problem. You know, I think um, uh, the church as well. You know, it can be involved in the problems of uh, ordinary citizens, or, uh, you know, we can kind of uh, focus on, uh, you know, uh, uh, much more narrower uh, sort of, uh, concerns. And so uh, bringing the population in. And of course, you know, I think social media has uh, played a very important role in recent years in, uh, you know, uh, communicating to citizens and empowering citizens. Uh, to communicate with their uh, leaders and uh, with each other, you know, to talk about uh, issues. They can see how things happen in other parts of the world and say, you know, we deserve the same thing. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, that has been very important in terms of uh, strengthening uh, civil society and uh, the democratic movement. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, for all of the uh, disappointment, I think that... Um, uh, Africans may have in you know democracy really maybe not delivering uh, what they had hoped. Um, you know the Afrobarometer surveys, for example, show that uh, there still is a lot a lot of support for democracy in Africa. In fact, uh, I think more than any other region in the world, uh, Africans uh, are supporting and demanding democracy. Uh, and so I think we can take a lot of inspiration, you know, just thinking about the question you had before, you know, even here in the United States, I think it would be great for Africans to come to the United States and, you know, tell their story about, you know, their struggle for democracy. Uh, you know, the elections in Kenya, uh, I think the U.S. could have uh, a lot to learn from, you know, uh, how uh, a, um, you know, defeated candidate can still accept the results. Um, uh, you know, I think... Um, uh, for anybody that's observed an, an African election, you know, to see the sort of uh, determination that people have, the, the voters, you know, standing in these long lines in the hot sun, you know, and uh, just uh, so committed uh, to uh, exercising their vote, that's inspiring. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I think these are some of the things that we've looked at over the years, uh, you know, in my own experience that uh, uh, you know, give me faith. Uh, that uh, Africa is making progress. When I first started in the job, you know, 1988, um, there were maybe three small countries that, by a stretch of the definition, could be called democracies. Today, uh, I dare say half of the uh, countries of the continent are uh, democracies. They may not be perfect, but uh, there's been an enormous amount of progress over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Thank you very much, uh, Dave. Uh, thank you. Ask another question. <laughs> And that was a very inspiring answer because the key is that there is progress and there is an opportunity to share experiences and to share lessons. Thank you so much. I would now invite members of the audience. Thank you for your patience. I will not summarize any of the responses. Just to take, I have one hand there. 
Oh, I hope we'll have enough time. Can you promise to introduce yourself and ask just one short question and identify the person on this panel, apart from me, that the question is directed? <laughs> so we'll start with the lady here. Can somebody pass out the microphone? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abella Bateunga and I'm from Tanzania. Um, I'm a youth mentor and a youth advocate in Tanzania. I've been doing the youth work for close to 14 years now. I think my question is to anyone who can take it. Uh, we have been saying youth since morning, but I'm curious, how do we define youth? Um, because they are not a homogeneous group. They come from different backgrounds, with different interests, with different reality. And um, are we talking about who one solution fits all, or should we unpack that? Thank you. Gentleman of the back. Yeah. No, the yeah, not no, you are pointing to him, but it's you. Yes, it's yes. Then after that, the gentleman at the back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mark Summers. I'm a longtime researcher in Africa, um, consultant now. Um, and have worked in the U.S. government as well. I want to start off by saying that I really want to congratulate the U.S. government for having this this um, this summit because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Biden administration. Yes, it was important. And, uh, we have a lot of work to do in the U.S. Uh, with Africa. There's no question about it. Um, I'm going to pose this question with reference to the fact that three of the five people on this panel are from Nigeria. <clears throat> and I think in talking to Nigerians, they're really terrified about this upcoming uh, election. There's a lot at stake, <clears throat> including peace. And I think uh, from my experience, it, it particularly researching uh, with African youth in cities, which is the future of Africa, that's where youth are going. Um, opting out of elections to them makes sense. And the reason is, I've heard this in so many countries. Yeah, they come in and want my vote, and then they forget about us. It's nothing. After a while, you get tired of voting for broken promises. I also wanted to point out um, this issue for Freedom House. Yes, 20 are considered not free, as Dave Peterson mentioned. Only eight countries in Africa are considered free. <clears throat> With regards to the work that's going on such as in Tanzania with civil society, there's not much peaceful dissent allowed on the continent. And so being in a youth organization is terrifying. You know you're gonna be surveilled. In, in, in many places, the government will actively try to co-opt you. <clears throat> Either you support their views or off you go. We'll, we'll see what happens to you. Um, so I, I guess I wanted to raise this because it seems to me that youth activism is much more, there's a lot more at stake for young people than I think we're taking advantage of. And I think um, this has been a little light on African governments, it seems to me. I'm a little struck by that because I think with, if, with solid youth representation in this, from Africa in this room, I don't think that they'd have that view if they were free to speak because they are harassed and it is difficult and organizing is dangerous. And so I think what we're doing really is talking about young people in Africa who are heroic in standing up to their governments and saying, we have a voice, we need it, and you need to listen to us, regardless of what you're doing. Um, we don't have to play by your rules. And I think not playing by the rules is what's going on in Nigeria. And I think, their role is, is up for grabs right now with regards to the election. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, this, I think this is a question that uh, Professor Okiji would address later. Uh, the first part of the question about Nigerians' anxiety about the next elections. Mm -hmm. And then any other panelists can take the rest. Um, we have to be very brief because I'm getting signals that we're almost out of time. And there are at least six hands up. And, and I'm all for inclusiveness, but you have to promise me that you'll be very brief. The gentleman at the back, can you be brief, please? I will try. Yes. <laughs> I, try. It, sometimes, you know, the, this 
My How do you introduce yourself, please? My name is Handel. I'm Lilo. I'm, um, I was born and raised uh, in Zimbabwe. I probably lived here longer than I lived in Zimbabwe, but that's where I come from. I am um, that in Zimbabwe, for example, the, the political space seems open when it is actually very close. There isn't a, a situation where we can think that opposition parties will win any elections when they are sophisticatedly rigged each time this happens. The world complains, and Zimbabwe complain. Um, Supreme, uh, the, the, the judicial system in Zimbabwe, you know, agrees with what the government is doing, and then we move on to the next election when the same thing will happen over and over again. My question is, what kind of um, incentives can um, the U.S. government put on, on authorities there to change their ways. And what can you, maybe in Africa and um, here, do to impress things there so that you know this rigging that is so sophisticated changes at some point, if that's possible. Thank you very much. Um, now I have on this side of the of the hall one, two, three, four. So I will start from the back. And um, please, uh, because I started from the front on this side. So for equity, we want to start from the back this time. So you have just one minute to introduce yourself and one short question. Thank you so much. Um, James Akaba, uh, I serve as the country director of Open Grids, a US nonprofit in Cameroon. Uh, so the quick question I have is that um, when you talk of Africa, Sometimes you look at it like uh, one bunch. But if you go into looking at Francophone Africa, I think there are lots of trouble areas in, that, in those zones and happen to come from one. So the question is, is the State Department setting Francophone Africa aside as a priority when it comes to aspects of democracy? And uh, another quick question, I watch TV often, I like the UN conference that often happens, I will see people from the government, they will come and have a very nice time painting an image of how things are very fine in the country. Why are people who don't have a voice just dying because of their terrible policies? Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, your question has been had on the side of the table. The next, the next question, yes, please. My name is Abayisu uh, Sisoko. I'm a senior program manager with the United States Department of Justice's uh, ADA mediation program and the vice president uh, for the Association for Conflict Resolution. And uh, my question is about inclusion, inclusion and equity. Uh, we're talking about 1.4 billion people in Africa, yet we have no seat at the UN Council. How can we do anything? You mean the Security Council? This, this US okay, thank you. Council, Security Council. So what can the US um, Africa relationship do to bring that to fruition? It's been an aspiration for decades. Thank you very much. The microphone moves forward. And we can only accommodate one more question, and it will be from the Madam uh, sitting here. So yes, you. Okay. The microphone is coming to you. All right, thank you. Thank you. My name is Laura Okonobi. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees for Nigerian American Public Affairs Committee. Um, this leadership summit is about identifying the gaps and how do we build the gaps. And they mentioned something very important, the church, the mosque, places of worship. This is a very important place of influence. How can the U.S., and I know that, you know, I'm sorry, uh, the State Department is not represented on this panel. But I'm hoping that one of the outcomes is that you're passing it on as policy re recommendation, right? Okay, so how can they create a, a pilot program that will bring the church, places of worship, to be part of this inclusion? Because we're talking about inclusion. They are in a better place to influence peace because that's what they teach in their, in their um, you know, congregation. And this is where the youth will listen more. And I agree with my sister, Youth is too much of a homogeneous category needs to be broken down. But this is a very important category that needs to be looked at, and including the diaspora. Thank you. So I need, I'm hoping that you guys will include that as part of the recommendation in what you do. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, we will have to now go online to see if there's any online participants. I'm sorry. We have you, are not, you are not inclusive. 
Trying to include this side online. That's really a question. Uh, so, I just just hold off for a while. Let's see whether we have anything online. Okay. Okay. Just take maybe one or two questions. Um. Okay. So here's our first question from an applicant youth perspective. How should the U.S. slash West square eliminating racial discrimination, gender slash minority slash use and inequality, corruption, supporting freedom, and et cetera, when dealing with the increasing autocratic regimes and rulers benefiting from the status quo who resent any conditionality and who can as easily turn to other international players, uh, China, Turkey, Russia, who demand no conditions? Um, what specific constructive positive roles can youth realistically play? Jackie. Uh, African American women are leaders in the electoral space uh, because we were the one of the last to get the vote. Look at recent elections in Atlanta, Georgia, like who supported Madam Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, our voices need to be at the table. We know how to organize and we have worked. Thank you very much. I have received and uh, we have this question. So I hope our panelists uh, uh, have heard this question. I have a strong um, request from two gentlemen for inclusiveness, but I have to plead with you that you only ask one question in one sentence. Is that okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so this is U.S. Representative of Washington, D.C., Dr. Oye Wolua. Thank you for being in my district and being the first Nigerian American in this office. It's a big honor and duty. One thing I heard you say that I appreciate is getting young people involved and having conversations between the diaspora in the United States and in continental Africa. My question is, how can we do that without getting politicians involved and having real dialogue amongst locals, whether in Nigeria, Ghana, here in the United States, black people, people who are not black that care about Africa, can have an open dialogue because people are paying attention both ways. Thank you very much. And the last will be the gentleman on the promise that is going to be just one sentence. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Benny. I'm just a common man. Um, my question is to Dr. Charles KJ. Do you think democracy is possible in Africa without a presidential term limit? Then a question to uh, Mr. Dave. Um, I don't think democracy should be considered as a big solution for the development in Africa. The example of Libya with Gaddafi, Gaddafi was not a Democrat, but Libya lived better during Gaddafi time than today. Uh, you say, one second, you're saying that uh, Africa has power. I think it's not possible because our money is decided here with World Bank, International Monetary Fund, our million are decided here. And you ask our democracy. Election to be credible in Africa, America has to say, okay, you. Do you think that is power? Thank you very much. Um, and on that note, I think this audience deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting questions. We would uh, begin our response from Professor Charles KJ. Uh, please keep it brief. I am being told by the organizers that you are way over time, and I would really appreciate if you can give us a brief response as well as the other panelists. So please, Professor KJ, you have the floor. Okay, I will thank you very much. I'll just uh, make two interventions and I will keep quiet. I know that you had asked a question about, there's been a question around the 2023 elections in Nigeria. Um, and I, I, my, my immediate response to that would be to say that, um, I don't know how many of you are aware that Nigeria defies logic. Um, those times when everyone thought that the country would implode, it had a way of pulling back from the brains. Um, and if we extend that to today, uh, I have a feeling that these elections will be full of surprises. And uh, how we, whether we are able to manage the surprises afterwards um, is a completely diff different issue entirely. But um, um, there's a whole lot of consciousness, um, a lot of um, social media attention to issues, uh, a lot of grassroots attention to issues, and so on and so forth. I, I suspect that, uh, and this is my own hunch, that this election is going to be, you know, um, defined, you know, 
the futures for Nigeria in the next 20 years. So if we get it right, yes. If we don't get it right, yes, still. Uh, the second issue I just want to point out very quickly is that um, I hear people say that um, there's always need for us to be inclusive in everything. But I also think that uh, um, uh, countries themselves, not just individuals, must come to equity with clean hands. And um, so if we're talking about, if you're preaching inclusive, inclusivity, for instance, I wonder why it was difficult for, you know, people like us, you know, um, you know to be able to um, apply for and get a visa, for instance, uh, to be able to join this conversation. And the more you make it difficult for constituencies like, you know, people in the intellectual space, people in civil society, you know, to be able to engage in this conversation in spaces like this, you, the whole idea of inclusivity becomes, you know, a big charade. The final point I will raise is to say ah. that um, we need to be attentive to the material base of democracy. Uh, we've seem to have invested so much in the forms and, you know, rituals of democracy. Yes, uh, yeah. Whereas, the... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, those are just the three issues I would like to raise. That's all. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. So, Dave, we are going to close in reverse on that. Uh, okay, and then... Yeah, I'd love to uh, respond to every one of these questions. They were all good. Uh, the last one, though, was uh, you know directed at me, so I better uh, at least answer that one. Um, you know, uh, I think that uh, you know there's no guarantee that democracy is going to uh, solve any uh, problems that, uh, countries have, and uh, you know I think, however, uh, there are uh, examples that we have of where democracy has worked and then has. Uh, really uh, produced results. I mean, South Africa many years ago, um, uh, you know, Ghana has done well under democracy. Uh, the Gambia has done well. Uh, you know, democracy has the potential to solve a lot of Africa's problems. Uh, you know, but it's got to be given a chance. And I think too often, uh, you know, you, you talk about um, the um, sort of a problem of resources and uh, you know, kleptocracy. African leadership, I think, uh, is a real problem uh, where uh, the leaders uh, will uh, steal the resources of the country and, you know, invest them in, um, you know, American real estate or, um, you know, uh, so, so we need to pay attention to that. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, there are enough examples of uh, democracy um, making a difference in delivering and, you know, I think, uh, 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 we can uh, only uh, uh, just keep working at this. It, yes. uh, the struggle continues. Uh, thank you very much. We can always continue the conversation after this session. So I would go quickly to to Ode to. Yeah, I'll just touch on a couple of points. Um, for me, I think there's a chance to strengthen democracy as it may be in Africa uh, with the US Africa Summit and also the Summit for Democracy coming up in March um, 2023. It's we we have to make these engagements move beyond just lip service, mm -hmm. um, because every time we have African leaders, the Nigerian president had come here in 2021 to make some um, um, commitments, verbal commitment, but no action has been made towards that till date, and he's going to be back here in 2023. Um, so what happens? Um, how do we begin to put? In one of the questions, talks about talked about incentives. Um, we. A part of the World Bank's SIFTA states um, transparency project, one of the things that project has done and put in place is for every um for you to access funds or support from the World Bank, there are um I think there are direct links indicators which you have to tick the boxes. This has set the foundation for young people for a um, moment for every citizen in the states to participate in government, which I think we should adapt in some of the support we are providing to Africa. In talking about the uh, the definition of youth, why it's intense. Um, so the African Union defines you, a young person as 18 to 35. Um, the Nigerian government just recently had put in the national youth policy from 18 to 29. Then political political parties have young people as, as old as 50. You know, so all that complication lies in between politics, uh, elections, when you want your vote, you run to young people, then you have governance. So one of the things we try to do on our end is to see how we can support young people to participate effectively in governance, not just the election, because once they come for your votes, it seems that's all, and you seem disinterested. I think the second person and speaker also talked about... Um, yeah, I'm sorry. What is that? Just to round off. Just round off, please. Yes. So it's more around the lack of 
accountability and lack of um, trust in governance process. That's why young people at the end of elections, we don't want to participate after then. But yes, um, for me, one size fits is all. Um, it's all the same issues we face. Um, so I think in as much as we want to face or address this issue, we have to be creative about it. Thank you. Yes, now, Cynthia, um, you have the last word. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'll touch briefly on the question regarding how do we define youth? Because I think by design, I, I rather, I'm rather youthful on this panel. And I'll share a little anecdote, which is when I was speaking at a conference in Cape Town, one of the participants said to us, uh, the problem with this generation of youth is that we're very impatient, we, we don't want to sacrifice, uh, and all sorts of things. And I said to them, who is raising this generation of youth? So from that, I think from we can actually just um, did you some of the question you had, which is youth is a very considerate phase. I think some of us who are in this room were once youth. So um, in as much as there are institutional definitions, which is 25 years for the United Nations and 35 years for the African Union, we all have a stake in um, youth matters because other at a point where we're young people ourselves, where we're raising youth at this moment. Thank you very much. Well. On this note, I want to thank our distinguished panelists, Ode Friday, Cynthia Chiguenya, Dave Peterson, Professor Charles KJ, for their presentations, and for you, our fantastic audience, as well as our online participants. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you so much.